Some of them imported some pretty rough models from overseas, which they hope to make their living out of. And the Prime Minister, uh, Mr Hughes, William Hughes, and the Minister for Defence, George Pearce, uh, also had faith in the future of aviation in Australia. Hughes had knowledge of how to get from London to Paris in an aircraft, and Pearce uh, was very impressed with what he'd uh, researched. Many of the schemes were untested <coughs> for these pilots that came back to Australia. They came back in dribs and drabs, and they took off in different directions, wanted to keep them together, but they had no plan. Uh, the plan was a blank sheet of paper. And so this is where the aero clubs got going. Early to mid-1919, they were a means of getting people together and maintaining their, their flying skills. So the first two were in New South Wales and Victoria <coughs> in mid-1919, and in August, uh, Queensland and South Australia got their aero clubs going. But in the meantime, a bloke called Norman Brealy had logged in Western Australia <coughs> with his two aircraft, and he was so far away from the, the main centre of aviation that he could virtually do what he liked. So there was no, even though the Australian Aero Club of Western Australia, or Western Australian section, uh, was on a piece of paper, uh, it never developed because Norman had his show going over here. These people who bought aircraft back were looking at uh, carrying passengers, freight, mail, photography, advertising, joy rides, and teaching people to fly. Remember at this stage, there was no department running the show, and uh, people could uh, fly an aeroplane if they liked. There were no licenses. So along came Norman Brealey to Western Australia. He was uh, born in Victoria, but he'd spent uh, a fair bit of his life over here from the age of early age. Um, <clears throat> Distinguished Order, Military Cross, Air Force Cross, um, mentioned in dispatches, and he quoted that he was late at the ARF, and um, he was a pretty notable character. He brought two aircraft with him uh, from, from Europe, from England. He assembled them at Belmont Park <clears throat> in mid-July 1919, and I'd ask you to look at the dates as we go through here, uh, because he moved fairly quickly. He had a plan in mind, and he rocketed along. On the 1st of August, he had uh, an ad in the Sunday Times, a complimentary photograph of his aircraft. Alongside of him was Peter Hansen, his mechanic, uh, and uh, a very astute mechanic too. So between the two of them, they put on a pretty good show. On the 2nd of August, the day after uh, the photo in the newspaper, he carried the Mayor of Perth on a flight. The uh, flight didn't go as well as expected. He positioned his aircraft at the Wacker Ground. It wasn't called the Wacker Ground in those days, but well, you know what I mean. It was the Cricket Association Ground. Um, he took the Lord Mayor, uh, Mr Latham, for a fly, and when he returned, his aircraft snagged the wires that went around the aerodrome. There was overhead lighting and wires, and he came to a rather nasty halt, broke the strut at the front of the aircraft and the propeller. But not to be outdone, <coughs> he quickly uh, jumped in a car, sped over to Belmont, picked up his second aircraft, and flew back and put on the greatest aerobatic display that Perth Heights had ever seen. Prior to that, the aircraft that had got in the air flew straight and level in a gingerly fashion, and what he was doing was spins, immelman turns, rolls off the top, immelman turns, you name it, he was doing it. He was a very qualified aviator. He had spent time at a special school of training, or flying, in England. And so on the 12th of August, and these aren't uh, all the ads and all the position places he went to, but on the 12th of August he was operating out of the Belmont Racecourse, um, charging $5 a flight per circuit. Pretty big money in those days because $5, five pounds, I'm sorry, five pounds was more than the average weekly earning for the, the average person. So um, he was raking a fair bit of money in. 
on the 16th of August, he was operating out of show, uh, Claremont Showgrounds. He often operated out of there. He went back many times to these places, um, taking people for, people for rides. He started to move out in the country. We've heard about him moving down to Quindanning, but he also uh, advertised that he was going to be at the York Show, and uh, that was on the 1st of October. September. This one's a bit out of place, <clears throat> but uh, he took George Moore uh, for a fly. Any of you aviators that remember windmills on farms which had uh, W.D. Moore on the, the vane? In fact, the, the saying used to be, if the vane of the windmill doesn't have W.D. Moore on it, don't believe in the wind direction because those other windmills don't tell the truth. <laughs> anyway, George was uh, the son of William Moore. And he went for a fly uh, with Norman on that day, as did many others. Uh, Loughton Park, <coughs> Perth Oval, um, with its next name, and I think it's Members Equity now, while it still survives. Off the Esplanade, it was called the Esplanade East in those days. It's now known as Langley Park. <coughs> Norman went as far as Kalgoorlie, he was operating out of the Kalgoorlie uh, race course. He went as far south as Albany. He even shipped his aircraft up to Onslow and uh, shipped it back again. It wasn't a smooth operation, but at least he got up there and started to work on the people of the outback. This is uh, a reminder of the lucky envelopes which he used to throw out uh, with cash prizes from the Swan Brewery. And very early in the piece, in the first weeks of him operating in Perth, he had a contract with Charles Moore and Company. Remember Charles Moore that went through from Hay Street to Murray Street? Um, and so, once again, he was throwing out uh, lucky uh, pamphlets and lucky uh, envelopes with cash prizes from both of those organisations and possibly others. It wasn't beyond him to overfly the city. Uh, <coughs> Elder's house uh, there. Um, I think that's, if you went up the road there, uh, you might end up at the entrance to the Embassy Ballroom and the Capitol Theatre. Um, and you might note the people looking out the window trying to see this aeroplane. They wouldn't have seen many in those days. And this, of course, got them talking about getting down to Loughton Park, Claremont, or something like that to have a fly or at least watch it happening. Brearley established himself on the uh, Esplanade. Um, Michael Durack, uh, a member of Parliament, lived just at the back of all that and Brearley got permission to uh, erect what you might call a hangar, uh, virtually on Langley Park or the Esplanade there. And so he operated out of there, operated joyrides, etc. And that's a photo of him uh, and John McIntosh uh, really sold, I'll use the word cautiously, sold uh, one or two aircraft, no one quite knows what happened, uh, to McIntosh. Unfortunately, McIntosh went up to Pathara uh, and uh, no one quite knows what happened up there, the story's still unsolved. But, um, he pranged, killed a passenger and himself. And so that was the first death due to an accident in aviation in Western Australia. That's his headstone that made at uh, Karakata. The Australian scene, just uh, moving back a little bit. Joyrides that people were making their money out of took place mainly at weekends. There was advanced advertising local newspapers, really used all this as well. Uh, I've checked back on the newspapers and he was having two or three ads during the week announcing what he was going to be doing over the weekend. And then the other ads on the weekend itself, special trams and trains were put on uh, to the sites where he's conducting his uh, flights. Leaflet drops we've talked about over towns, but if though in the eastern states, many different operators were trying to make a living 
and they were going to various country towns and dropping leaflets the day before uh, or during the week leading up to their proposed flight. They put on an aerobatic display as well to wake everyone up. Of course, we've talked about lucky tickets and envelopes, aerobatic displays, joyrides for locals. And as well as charging five pounds per flight, they'd say, if you want to, Farmer Jones, if you want to fly over your farm, they'll do that for seven pounds. And so Farmer Jones would fly over his farm and have a look at it. And when he get back, his neighbour might say to the pilot, how high did you go with him? And he said, oh, a thousand feet. And he said, take me up to 1,500. I always want to be one better than him and I'll pay you 10 pounds. <laughs> so it was a bit of competition among farmers there. Great hide for more cash. <coughs> But uh, these new businesses were tried, uh, no one knew whether they were going to be uh, successful or not. They couldn't survive on enthusiasm alone. Accidents were inevitable. And some of the problems were poor maintenance. Um, these aircraft came in in ones and twos, dribs and drabs, without any spare parts up their sleeves. Uh, lack of landing grounds. Uh, in 1919, there were virtually no aerodromes in Australia, one or two that the Australian Flying Corps had set up, but in the country towns, no aerodromes at all. The aircraft were kept in the open, <coughs> they operated in farm paddocks with rough surfaces, uh, positioning fuel became a problem, um, they got good support from the fuel suppliers, and uh, there was a lot of wartime fuel hardiness which led to accidents. The main problems, patchy income, work at weekends, long distance between centres, uh, intervals between visitors going back to the same place again and again, your customers dry up. Main problems, aviation became a free for all. We're still talking about 1919 here. Uh, people just doing as they liked, when they liked. The press got hold of uh, anything they could put in the paper. Um, they reported all mishaps. Uh, they said it was uh, unsafe and uh, they blamed the lack of regulations. The government was working in the background, uh, but the wheels of motion were very slow to proceed. What's changed? What's changed? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so in the early days, the Air Tra uh, Traffic Committee was set up. It met first in February 1919. This is before a lot of these people had got back, but they didn't move very quickly. Um, <coughs> and virtually nothing happened for 12 months. A bit like Canberra at the moment, isn't it? A couple of people had a lot to do with it. Uh, George Pierce, yes, and Colonel Legg. Uh, Major General Legg at that stage. And the committee recommended that they work under a single legislature. And so by mid-1919, they were looking at one set of legislature to govern all flying in Australia. And so the Air Navigation Act came along in 1920. It was granted assent on the 2nd of December. But <coughs> the state premiers had to agree on signing over their state rights to the federal government to make it work. Of course, that presented problems. What's new? No. Um, but eventually it did happen uh, that the federal government took over the control of aviation. The act came into being on the uh, 11th of February 1921. It was deceptively simple and provided for testing, license of pilots, license of maintenance of personnel, airworthiness inspection of aircraft, registration of aircraft, licensing of aerodromes, and rules of the air. People used to fly down to almost whatever height they liked in those days prior to this. And so the Act came into force in mid-1921. And that was the start of things becoming sensible in Australia. Of course, Norman Brealey had been a rule and a law unto himself in Western Australia, 2,000 miles away from where all this was going on, and he didn't seem to take much notice of it. He was doing uh, very well. He was very competent. He was confident. He had connections. Um, and so he, uh, he progressed very well. He 
But this was the turning point. What happened? Many aeroplanes just disappeared. They were beyond repair, uh, as did a number of maintenance people and pilots just disappeared into the, the blue. And uh, pilots began to fly by rules. The Civil, a uh, civil uh, Aviation Branch was set up as part of the Department of Defence and the Civil Aviation Controller uh, was hired and that was uh, Brinsmead and you hear that name from time to time mentioning the history of uh, aviation in Australia. Brinsmead uh, showed um, initiative and resourcefulness. He was very good, well chosen. And subsequent events proved that the appointment was justified. Uh, people, were, most people were very happy uh, when they look back on what he did. His assistant was a man, a West Australian, Edgar Johnson, and that name comes up in the history books as well. And so the stage was set for people to operate efficiently, and those companies were West Australian Airways, uh, Qantas, and uh, in New South Wales, there was Aerial Services of Australia, operated by a boat called uh, Larkin. And uh, there were many others, fly-by-nighters, and others trying to make a living, uh, too many to mention here. So they were the two people that really controlled uh, aviation in Australia, and uh, we are to them setting up a pretty good show. 